Wow. Welcome. Welcome. We're, um, it was a uh, negative 70 wind chill. <laughs> so we're, no, we're warm. <laughs> welcome. Welcome to uh, Native Wellness Institute. Uh, we are, I think, 266, 67 power hours since May, since March. Um, and we've come to all of you out there and we come as bringing something positive, productive, proactive. And so today we are very honored, um, you know, Nistu Mokoyo Sokoyi, my Blackfoot name. Um, I always say my slave name is Theta Nubras that I pay um, taxes with. <laughs> But, and also, that's what you see, Theta New Brass, and I got a couple of degrees from UC Berkeley, but what's more important is um, my elders and my ancestors continually teach me, and so I'm still a teachable student. So that's um, who, uh, who I am. I'm part of the Native Wellness Institute team. I'm uh, one of the elders because <laughs> the definitions of elders, you know, they always say you got some old people and then you got some wise people. <laughs> we're just, we're, um, but I'm excited. And the joy that I have is that we're inviting you to look at the healing of the topic around um, racism, uh, colonization, uh, BIPOC healing. Uh, Black Indians healing, Maroons healing, Red Bone healing. And so I am going to be the, the facilitator of this, but I wanted to invite you to, to uh, our guest of honor is just an incredible woman that um, our tribes in Montana, we got to know her uh, beginning in 2008 when all of the eight tribes in Montana worked for the Obama campaign. And then we continually get to know her because she helps with our legislature at the state level, at the federal level, and at the tribal level, we always ally with each other. Um, some people call it solidarity, but I wanna just have, um, welcome Judith, please tell everybody who you are, girlfriend. Uh, okay, so I'm Judith Heilman. Uh, I'm Black. I'm a veteran Black person of 68 years, so I'm an elder too. Um, <laughs> yes! <laughs> I live in Bozeman, Montana. I've lived here since 2005, but I was born in San Francisco and raised in the South San Francisco Bay Area. Um, so I, I have a background after all these years that I call a checkered background. <laughs> which is often seen as something negative, but I make fun of it. It's not negative at all. But um, so I, I bring law enforcement experience of 13 years. I was a veteran cop and um, just a lot of different things, including, um, gee, I was even a travel agent for a while. But, but yes, I was the um, 2012 Obama state um, campaign manager, re-election campaign manager here in Montana. We weren't trying to win the state. Don't worry. It wasn't, you know, it's not like we failed. We were supporting the back, the battleground states. And so we, we were very successful in that regard. And then afterwards, I worked for Every Town for Gun Safety as the National Law Enforcement Outreach for a while. And when I burned out of all of that, I was really tired and it was very frustrating. Um, I just took a break and then I said, what am I going to do next? Because I'm, I'm never finished with doing good stuff. Uh, meaty stuff, stuff that really helps the community, not just me in particular, um, it's, it's the broader community at large. And so I decided that I really, really needed and wanted to go into, right, into um, eradicating racism, bigotry, and prejudice in all its many forms, uh, which is a huge task. <laughs> uh, we're chipping away at it, right? <laughs> and we're doing it in Montana. This is the only, Mon uh, the Montana Racial Equity Project is the name of our organization. And it is, um, it's the only 501c3 charitable black founded foundation, uh, excuse me, um, nonprofit in Montana. And we choose to work racism, bigotry and prejudice with a very inclusive lens. So we're always working with Native Americans, with 
LGBTQIA+, including Two-Spirit, and um, just the two most persecuted religions and disabled people and all that kind of stuff. So, um, and our staff, we have a staff of eight and a half right now, which includes me, but our, thank you, thank you. It started at my kitchen table just a little over five years ago. <clears throat> and our staff is like half black, half native of different tribes and one person of Puerto Rican heritage. And we have the most lit office. It is so much fun. We are, <laughs> it's this combination of black lingo and native stuff. And, and we even have, we, we have office dogs and one, we have a, a woman who's Crow who has a dog and has, and gives him his commands in, in the Crow language and Salata. And so some of our staff are, are picking up some of those crow terms uh, in order to tell their dog to sit or stay or lie down, which is just really <laughs> fun. It's a, we love each other. We, we have the best time. And I know some of them are listening now, so I'll say, hey. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, you know, um, that solidarity between um, everyone, we always, called it darker than a paper bag you know yeah darker than a paper bag the way that we chip away is we all come together and help each other and but um the first uh Absalaga, and um the first couple of words i learned was um how they say uh creator akpadadia but then the second because i always ask and that's a you know cultural appreciation thing is always ask the person how they refer to god or the creator or the maker mm -hmm. you know, northern cheyennes it's mahio um us it's it's um and so it's um it's just a very graceful way to learn something in a cultural appreciation way. But the second word I'll just say before I give you the floor is I learned um, how you say Ishpu because Indians love tripe. <laughs> they, you know, they butcher and they clean it and they make, you know, um, all kinds of dishes with it. And um, so that was my second crow word so that I needed to learn because I like to eat tripe, you know? <laughs> so, so Judith, we're um can you help us with our larger audience because this we're calling this racism as a pandemic and it's it's not something you had said that we could get a shot for but can you can you help us begin to say how do we or uh, how do we begin to heal or chip away at this um and give us examples of what your organization is doing because we might create 49 more of your organizations in the other 49 states. So can you please talk about that? I can. And Theta, I love you. I just love you. Okay. <laughs> and your mom and Lori. And, you know, so anyway, I just have to get that out. It just, my heart is just going mm. uh, to be here. So um, racism as a pandemic, yes and no. It is, it is not a pandemic in the, in the way that uh, the coronaviruses and COVID-19 and that um, scientists and medical professionals develop a vaccine, you know, over a period of months or years, and you get a shot so that you're inoculated against being, doing racist things or, or saying racist things or thinking racist things. What it is though, it is definitely um, comparable to a disease that we all have from the moment that we take our first breath that we always have to work on every day. Um, a very conscious effort to be what we could call an anti-racist um, instead of just um, soaking in what the culture that we grow up in, in which we live and circulate and socialize within, um, letting it infect us in ways that we're not even aware of. And mm -hmm. I like to say that it's <clears throat> that working on this, on eradicating 
elements of racism, bigotry, and prejudice in each of us individuals, even as people of color, Black, Indigenous, and people of color, which stands for which BIPOC. So if you hear the term BIPOC, that stands for Black, Indigenous, and people of color, especially here in the US. It's like being a recovering alcoholic or recovering um, substance abuse um, addict is that it's just something that you have to work on every day and in all ways, because it's always there ready to pop out when you don't even know that it's there, you know? Mm -hmm. So it takes reading, it takes really lots of thoughtful, um, thoughtful time by yourself, thoughtful uh, conversational engagements with people who are on the same journey and reading and listening to podcasts if you have them, watching some films on YouTube if you have access to those, um, reading magazine articles, newspaper articles. I mean, there's a lot of trash out there, but there's a lot of really, really good stuff out there. And it's this, and this pandemic is very broad. It doesn't just affect our physical health, it affects our mental health as well absolutely and our physical health in very many ways in that for those of us who are paper bag or paper bag color or darker or even lighter because you can you can you can look what to the white world looks like you're very white but you have black parents or a black parent or an indigenous parent or two and you and you have um and just very light skin and non kinky hair. And maybe your hair isn't black, it's more light colored. Maybe you've got hazel eyes or even blue eyes. My sister has blue eyes. She's darker than me with blue eyes. She's also gorgeous, which, you know, what can I say? <laughs> I'm very proud of my sister. Um, <laughs> love her dearly. So we, you know, we're culturally, we're that way. Culturally, we're that way. but. We have to have these conversations with each other where we're listening with intent rather than listening. Don't even bother engaging in a conversation with someone about racism, bigotry, or prejudice where, that, uh, where the person you're speaking with is, list, is listening only to rebuke or rebut. There's no conversation to be had. They're not interested in learning anything. They're not interested in hearing about your personal experiences of where you had realizations where you did something that was racist or that you saw something that was racist and thought, oh my God, I've done that too. Or I thought that the same, I thought the same thing. Their goal is to get you frustrated enough to not even bring it up again because they're uncomfortable. They don't wanna even hear about it. A lot of people will say, I just wanna, and a lot of people say, I just want, I, I, I'm just really into peace. And I, I, I just want to be peaceful. I don't want to talk about it. And what that means is they're shutting you down. Then they don't want to look, they don't want to self-examine themselves, whether they're black, indigenous, or white, or whatever race, or whatever yeah. combination of races. That's it, that whole thing about being peaceful and wanting unity and things like that, that's shutting it all down. That's not even dealing with it. We, need, we all really, really, really need to deal with it because in that regard, it is a pandemic since the first white person stepped foot on this soil, which Turtle Island, right? Turtle Island? Yeah. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and all the negative encounters with uh, indigenous here. And then 1619, when the first black person was brought over on a ship in chains, stepped foot on this, on this land and was enslaved. So as far as indigenous and black people, we have so freaking much in common as far as our, our um, oppression and uh, always being the lowest caste, always being the, um, the people who were thought to be not intelligent, to just be brute forces, to feel no pain, to, uh, to not have any culture and all that kind of stuff where white people, when I call it a crime of, a crime of caucasity, 
Mm. <laughs> a, a number of people around the world will recognize that term. <laughs> For white people who call themselves Caucasian, that's where we get that from, a crime of caucasity, where they will just do something that just doesn't make any sense at all. And it's all about them. And they don't know, they don't understand racism, bigotry, or prejudice at all. They think they do, but they don't. And you and I, Theta, would know that they don't. Many other Black and Indigenous and other people of color would know that they don't. But here we are. We're working on it. Our organization, it's, um, you know, we're constantly butting our heads up against a wall, but there are successes. And we do have very, you know, a lot of really, really supportive people who are non-melanated, <laughs> who support our work and who support our desire to have a solidarity between Native Americans here in this country and Black people. And, then, and by solidarity, I mean where we support one another because in, in our endeavors to to be free yes. for civil rights, to yes. be able to breathe and walk and drive and without being um, discriminated against, for, that, for education, to plant gardens, to eat fresh, safe food, to care for the environment, the whole justice for the environment. You got justice for the environment, you'll have justice for all of us too, because we're so those of us who are BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, and people of color, so many of us live in areas where, where um, the property values are deemed to be lower because we are living there. And so factories that are produce a lot of pollution can get cheap land and then also do as much as they can to keep their costs down by putting out all sorts of pollution, whether it's into the ground, into the water, or into the air, where we have cancer alleys, where we have cancer, cancer clusters around, where pollution is put into the, the creeks or the, the lakes or you know the ponds and things like that, and into the air and into the soil. Um, I could go on and on. I feel like I'm yammering right now, but tell oh, me no, what you no. think. <laughs> I, we really, we really appreciate this because you're saying to us just what we're doing now is we're having an intentional dialogue, and that's Native Wellness Institute. All our power hours are about intentional dialogue so that we could start the healing. So you've said several things, but I'll, I'll take um, one thing and just comment on that. Um, you know, when um, when you have an Indian person who has lighter skin especially if they can pass. And I also know, you know, if, um, high yellow <laughs> are, yes. are those that, 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 can, that, that can pass. Um, I've heard in groups where we're in talking circles, I've heard um, the ones that are darker than a paper bag express pain mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. that is not an option for them to pass. Mm -hmm. So they, they by no means can pass into white privilege. Yeah. You know, there's, and, and so maybe we could talk about the healing of, you know, cause like our colonization process, you know, it was, you know, the came, they took away how we prayed. Mm -hmm. They disenfranchised our men, which just means they lock them up or get them addicted. You know, yeah. just give them opioids, get them on fentanyl, give them Budweiser. And then you take out the men and then you don't have your protection and your nurturers. Mm -hmm. um, then the colonization took our language. Of course, you know, you know, uh, took our land and um, did all of these. And then they just add something. They add a drug. That's why a lot of natives are saying that addiction is slavery for us, because mm -hmm. if we're addicted, we can never rise up or become empowered or become effective again because they just keep you high enough so you lay on the couch and watch Netflix all day. You know? And I'm not saying that's bad but because then we're in a pandemic. But Judith, maybe if you could, you know, um, we wanted to invite you here today because we're looking at the healing of it. You yeah. know, we're looking at the healing and I know your group in these last five years, I mean, we hear about you in the streets, you know, we hear about you on the res, 
you know, can you tell us some of the action? I mean, just like, how did you hire these half Indian people? I mean, what, what, share with <laughs> us, because you're talking about systems change, mm -hmm. you know, and in systems change, you're part of the, you're changing the system. Can you articulate some of that, Judith? I can, there's a lot to it. So let me try to um, talk about two or three of them. Okay. okay. Um, first off, you know, it just started out with just me and then I was able to hire an American Vista and then I was able to hire a full-time person. And then <clears throat> this time last year, it was just me and one other full-time person and two part-time students. Mm -hmm. and, or maybe I think it was three part-time students. And then George Floyd was so horribly, horribly murdered. Um, so all the plans that I had for our organization where we were already overworked and we really, really wish that we could dive deeper into criminal justice reform, education reform, health well-being, um, and community engagement. Suddenly it woke a lot, a lot, a lot of, a lot of white people up non-melanated folks and melanated as well. And we were already situated, we were already known in Montana for doing good work, um, putting on great workshops to help people recognize their biases and when they didn't even realize they had them or they suspected they had them. And then in, the, and in an eight hour workshop, it's like, oh my God, I, I, I got a lot of stuff to fix <laughs> in myself. <laughs> And as one of one of our one of one of our students uh, actually was taking the class, a, a white gal, um, young mom, and she said later uh, about maybe a third of the way into the class where she had this thought inside of her brain, like, "Oh my God, I'm white." <laughs> She'd been white since birth, you know. So it was just this recognition that you're not just you but you have a racial identity, right? Everybody has a racial identity. So, and, and it depends on how other people see you. They look at you as brown. Do they look at you as, as Northeast Asian, as Southeast Asian? Do they look at you as indigenous? Do they look at you as Latinx um, or, you know, all these different races? Yeah. Um, so, so we were able to hire a lot more people because a lot of people started donating to us that had never donated to us before. So we were able to, also one of the big things was to be able to really expand our equity, inclusion and justice consulting that we do for nonprofits, for, for companies, for institutions. We'll even do it for law enforcement agencies. There is a fee, it's expensive work. Um, people will try to ask us to cut our fee. Like, oh, we're a nonprofit too. And I go, well, we're a nonprofit as well. And, <laughs> and, and also if they're even a company or an instant or even a government, government institution say, a police department might be interested in us coming in and talking with them about implicit and explicit bias, you know, and racial profiling. Mm -hmm. But they say, we can't afford you. I go, well, listen, consider, consider this um, like reparations <laughs> because yes. there's, there's this huge racial wealth gap and we're all minority, racial minorities in our organization. Even our board of seven is three black, two native and two white. So, um, and then there's LGBTQIA all through there and a couple of disabilities and all that kind of stuff. So we're really, we're really rolling. Um, so on that. Our lived experience is huge. Our, our combined lived experience is huge. So I'd say, you know, consider it reparations. And then if they go, eh, I go, well, listen, for years we were only paid in lashes. So pony up. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yeah. And Thank what you. can you say, really? What can you say to that? What, you know, what really, what can you say to that? That's, that's, what, it's, that's what it's all about, right? Right, yeah. but but Judith, that is so beautiful because that um, what we get paid, you know. So everybody darker than a paper bag, <laughs> you know. Uh -huh. If we look at if we can just look at what the level of pay, and then it, you know if we look at women, 
if we look at, um, you know, that part of healing from this, it, there has to be some kind of equity about paying everyone the same. I mean, even, you know, even with this $15 per hour is just, a, that is a leveling that is bringing up so many, because so many of us in poverty, a lot of, um, you know, I always say at our tribal college, 25% of our students live on 5,000 per year mm. are with the family. So then we bring safety nets so that they can still not go to get their education and not drop out of school and not go into student loan debt. The other student loan debt is slavery. <laughs> so we won't go, you know, the, the, some of the equity. So um, this, this chipping away because we're, um, we're part of the solution, you know? And so can you, can you speak a little bit more about sometimes when we're in our mental health and who we are, we get hurt and we might, we do that lashing out, yeah. you know, like I, I'm wearing, you know, po Pocahontas was a badass and I wore it today because when I was making a lot of trips to Washington DC doing lobbying and I was just traveling and when Elizabeth Warren got called that because of how I have braids, um, I got called Pocahontas in an airport, in a hotel, um, and in different places. And so then I just made this shirt, Pocahontas was a badass. And so I would wear it traveling. And what it did is it started a conversation. <laughs> we started like conversating, like what you were saying, an intent are they you know that made them say who well and then you know who is pocahontas you know even <laughs> right <laughs> so many people don't even know they're calling out pocahontas and they don't even know who pocahontas really was or that they that she really existed and you know, right true story how, in, how intelligent she was and how she was beautiful and how uh, you know it was in her so maybe um let me ask this then one of the things we've ha we found in the native community is that the stronger you are in your cultural identity, mm. and uh, even with kids that um, try to commit suicide, or um, domestic violence, or even uh, those that end up in trafficking themselves, that the stronger they are in their cultural identity, they can get out and heal from that 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 the stronger their identity of in their language um you know like learning uh i was just remembering in billings we had all these uh tribal kids you know and they're really teenagers that had been kind of tossed aside the family didn't know what to do with them and i just remember when they first learned to sing they had a big drum and they first learned to sing their one song and the marcus red thunder took them to all the powwows and they only knew that one song but they would just go there and sing that one song and then they learned a second song and then started making their dance regalia and then they you know from their tribe from their tribe are learning and then they started dancing and then you could just see the the pride come to them so this um this question around can you expound on you know that black identity people of color identity, indigenous identity, and how important that is all for all of us in our solidarity. So important, so important. And that's another reason I love the staff in our office, you know, and the, and, and our, indi our indigenous and, and black and Puerto Rican mix is because we can revel freely in our own um, cultural styles and in our, the things that we hold dear. Um, us black gals are always talking about, oh, let's get braids or let's do this or do twists or, you know, whatever with our hair and, you know, come in also wearing these great bright colors or just something just kind of wild that would be frowned on, frankly, in, um, in most white work settings. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I couldn't get away with half the stuff that I do um, where I used to work with that were white work settings. And um, 
you know, we just, we were able to support each other that way. And we grow stronger in our own cultural identity that way. And also less willing to compromise. And that's the thing about the Montana Racial Equity Project and me being able to found it and bring some really strong values to it is that we have a no compromise um, stance on racism, bigotry, and prejudice. If we find that we're we, we're collaborating with somebody who ends up microaggressing us, or w- meaning saying something or do saying or doing something um, to to us or about us in public or even in private, that's very racist. That's mm-hmm. very painful. Um, why we don't want to keep working with them? They yes. have they're they're not far enough along in their journey um, to becoming an anti racist. Um, because we don't want to put ourselves in deliberately in harm's way. Yes. So, right. And, yes. and, and I know you can identify with this. Um, and so that's why I really look forward to more support and the solidarity of the support that indigenous and black people in particular can give one another um, in this country. If we can get past any, those of us within our own races who might have uh, a prejudice or just dis- feel discriminatory towards say native towards black and black towards native because i know some of that exists out there which is i think is like where did you get that oh yeah white people you know you, you know, that's 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 a colonization thing that you've succumbed to and you need exactly. to just get rid of that because we have so many things where we've been deliberately sterilized. We haven't been, you know, as far as healthcare goes and, um, you know, there were the smallpox smallpox blankets. We had the Tuskegee study. We, the the speculum for vaginal examinations for pap smears and stuff like that was developed um, by a doctor during um, the enslavement period here in the United States who did all his operations to test, to develop these tools and procedures without anesthetic on black, on black women who were enslaved. He had anesthetic, but he only wanted to use that on white people. He thought it was a waste to use it on black women. And his name was Sims and there's some statues of him that exist in this country that are now being taken down and removed and put somewhere else because he's not to be honored. He, um, he tortured, he, he tortured many, many, many black women um, so that he could uh, provide better care for white women. Yes, and, yes. <clears throat> right, and so. And, you know, some of, um, I think with this solidarity, like listening to you, your stories, um, I think part of us coming together is listening to our sterilization stories like you know just here in our tribe you know we as um you know my mother was 37 years old at, out in oakland and they were saying that she should have a hysterectomy and so i'm just you know and then we thought we started visiting with our cousins who went to indian health service clinics and they were saying without a second opinion that we found out all of our cousins were just given a hysterectomy as you know to have they didn't want no more children but it was the option with no second opinion with not looking at the decisions and so we didn't have any of our women who had a natural menopause and this this was because menopause is um in our tribal way is a very sacred time Mm. because it's a rite of passage when when a woman goes through her last bleed she reflects on her life of decisions she made uh, based on hormone and not Mm -hmm. her not her authentic self oh wow that rite of passage Mm -hmm. that woman then she um gets joyful because then she's on a journey of her authentic self not stuff defined Mm -hmm. how she should be but how who she really needs to become so just even that you you 
telling us that history you know and as you were talking you know i was thinking um this chipping away because you know like with indians you know like um a racist thing that people say to us is oh did you make those earrings <laughs> oh did you sew that dress it's like a patronizing patronizing us is a form of racism it is you know? I don't go, I don't go and say, oh, did you make that diamond, you know, or did you make that whatever, you know, um, so then just learning to um, go with intent of listening to each other's story, yes. you know, just listening. I mean, I love hearing the stories of families and in my lineage that came over to Allison Island and had nothing had nothing in how they allied with each other, how they um, prospered. You know, one of my grandpas, all his, you know, I love hearing their stories because my grandpa went, ran away from his, his people and lived with the Indians and never went back. But for us to heal, our family through Ancestry.com, we looked up and sought out our white relatives Mm -hmm. We found our white relatives in Wentworth, South Dakota, and my mother, my Uncle Gerald, my Aunt Carol um, Arrowtop, uh, my daughter and our Chihuahua, we went over there and we met our white relatives and it was so healing. It was it was kind of weird because when we got there, you know, like we're sitting, you know, we're sitting in their living room and they were prosperous because they had homesteaded and they they made well. Homesteaded on native land that have been taken by the U.S. government. Yeah, uh -huh. right. Right. So we're we're sitting there, and and you know, it was that little awkward moment. But, but you know, <laughs> you know, the facilitator I am. I just said, yeah. I said, we're not here. We don't want none of your stuff. <laughs> we don't come to get so. We don't want any. We just want to know you. We just want you to to visit with you. We just want to prepare some meals with you. Uh, we just want to sit down and tell tell you about my grandpa. And that's, we just, you know, the tears for the next three days, we just ate together and visited together. And it was healing. And I'll just, I'll say this one, my one relative that was quote unquote, very ism, had some racism. They were scared for him to meet us because of our color, you know? <laughs> but when he met us and we were truly his relative he went down in the basement and brings up boxes of all of the material of all of as our ancestors came over here where they were buried where they went and we began that healing together when we're mixed race but i i i want to uh judith um i want our audience are uh, for us to look it's 2021 we just come through a lot of healing in this last four years we just came you know since may 25th the george floyd united us in a way that's never been in the world but in 2021 what can we do i mean like in from now to like december what kinds of things can we do? I mean, because I can think of one, we could try to get shots for everybody. <laughs> you know, like get shots for everybody. You know, like not COVID just, shots. Yeah, yeah, like COVID shots, mm -hmm. not pieces shots. Yeah. That's a secret. No. <laughs> well, I mean, I, yeah, I could, I could, I have a little bit of a backstory about that as far as Montana goes. Yeah. Um, because I've been um, on the. I've been the representative black person on, <laughs> on the state of Montana COVID task force. Um, there are a number of indigenous from numerous tribes and Indian health service and things like that on there, but I was the only black person. And, and there I was advocating on behalf of black people and frankly, all BIPOC, all BIPOC for, um, to get us moved up into phase 1B. Uh, Native Americans were recognized as they need to be in phase 1B. <clears throat> but despite all the, all the history, all the facts, all the studies, the scientific studies that have been going around in America and across the globe, but specifically here in America, um, on how 
Black, Indigenous, and Brown people are so much more likely to, um, to acquire the coronavirus and get COVID-19 and die from it far more than our um, than the ratios of our populations, they it it it, it was a heavy lift. Frank, it was a it was eventually successful, but it was a heavy lift getting um, BIPOC in phase one B, not just natives. Which I was really glad the natives were in there, but the rest of us BIPOC needed to be in there too. And so now my team is almost fully vaccinated or they're signed up to be vaccinated. So that's just terrific. That's um, awesome. Yeah, and it's just so important. And then there's also this education that has to be done because of the history of medical racism, healthcare racism, and the Tuskegee stuff and the, and the, um, the hysterectomies that weren't supposed to be done, that was supposed to be just an appendectomy, but it turned into a hysterectomy and all yeah. these other things that you have talked about. Um, and the lack of care, so many black people were dying and you would see little films of this, like this one woman, Dr. Susan Moore, I think her name was in Indiana. And she's a yeah. doctor and she was suffering from COVID and she put a little video out on her phone about what from the hospital about how she was being terribly and horribly racist treat, treated in a very racist manner. And she ended up dying from COVID because they weren't giving her the pain medication from the pain that she was suffering and all these other things. It was just horrible, horrible. And so to have, um, okay, so I got off track here. I lost my, I lost my place, what started me. Um, no. No, but we're just talking about what we can do in 2021 because like yeah. it, you know, it's Black History Month. Give us some, you know, because we want to we want to move into action. But in yeah. and we always Native Wellness, we call it healing action. We want to move into healing. action. So can you articulate some of the things that those that are watching us, how we could start to take action in 2021? Well, you know, one of the actions that I would love to see, and it's and it's more subtle than anything, it's more behind the scenes, is reach is for native and black people and brown people to be reaching out to one another in our shared struggles and to be supportive in one another, to be supportive of one another as groups um, on things that it's not our particular struggle, but because we're brothers and sisters in this struggle, the paper bag thing, remember, that we should be there to support one another. Say for instance, when I came up to Idle No More, when was that? In 2016, 2000? Yes, no, yes. 19, <laughs> I don't know, I remember. It, all I remember is it was a really cold January day up at the Capitol. <laughs> and there I was with my, there I was with my sign, the only black person there amongst us this on this great idle no more demonstration with my sign saying this African American supports idle no more, you know. Um, so I go back a ways on that kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah. Then we just for Dakota Pipeline, for Keystone XL, for you know the tar sands and all those kinds of things that we can be supportive on. Where this is a fight over native land, over over water, you know. Um, and, and clean air and unpolluted soil. Mm -hmm. um, and there are things that we can be supported on too by Native Americans in things that might be only just a, a black thing or might yeah. be just an Asian thing or something. But this is given this is black American, excuse me, black history month here. So we're talking about um, black and, indig and indigenous. Um, I'm all for that solidarity, for the support, for reaching out, for learning more about our respective cultures, not only, for, not only about our my respective culture, but about your culture, about yeah. the culture of the Crow tribe, about the culture of the Wampanoag tribe, of the culture of Osage, and you know, I'm probably butchering some pronunciations, I don't know, but that kind of a thing and it's because there's a lot of people out there that don't under, that don't understand that there's a number of different like over 500 almost 600 tribes right federally yes. federally u.s federally recognized tribes the colonizer 
um, you know, that there are differences, some tribal differences, but there's so much in common. And it's the yeah. same with black people, you know? Yeah. Same people. Well, maybe um, we could, um, in our remaining time, talk about um, the spirituality of it. Um, and I'm learning, you know, in, in Blackfoot, we call it, and I got it up on the, I put it in the window, Atsimoyi Kani, and it means the spirituality. I believe that spirituality is a point that which we could connect. And it's not that we're going to try to make Indian prayers or I'm going to try to adapt to your African uh, prayers. It's that um, we just find collective ways to um, support each other spiritually. And, and you spoke of the water, mm -hmm. you know, like just going around collectively as a group praying together over the water uh -huh. and Montana has triple divide. We're the, we're the glaciers that feed or standing rock goes on the Missouri that mm -hmm. feed the Hudson that feed the Pacific, but that praying over water, appreciating water and bringing, you know, just like with Navajo nation, there was a lot of solidarity just to bring good water to our Navajo people, you know, and, and then that helped because with COVID. Um, so maybe the spirituality and, and I also think spirituality will help um, lessen the poverty, <laughs> you know, the, the, because part of the colonization process is that BIPOC and, and the tribes were, were, or, you know, lucky if we get to middle class. <laughs> yes. But, but it's like, it's not, um, you know, unless, well, unless mm -hmm. like the colonizer where uh, money is their God, you know, because like Indians, we have a different value. We, we give away, <laughs> you know, if we have yeah. X, we give it away, mm -hmm. you know, if we, if are we, um, you know, just with like food and food disparity, um, we just made sure that everybody, I mean, everyone even hunted, you know, I got people were bringing elk meat, people were bringing buffalo meat. And then last night I got to eat, you know, a, a relative catching fresh fish, and baked fresh fish that he gave to my mom. And I just eating, I, I was like a spiritual thing. I just felt like I felt loved because my nephew fished and gave it to my mom and then my mom cooked it and then I got to eat it I just like I just said I wow. got tears I just said mom I said these this fish tastes so good I feel like I'm like I'm getting filled up with love and of course she made her banana nut bread and oh. you know how uh, corn on the cob and she give me better bread. notice and I will get in my car <laughs> and be <I> right there. <laughs> well, <laughs> when we can gather yeah, oh. when we can when we can <laughs> so what um in uh, yeah. our, re our remaining time what would you like to um fill our audience's hearts with what would you like to share with them i would like to share with people um because there's a lot of black people who don't know about this either but and probably natives to look into black liberation theology Ah. Uh -huh. Yeah, you can Google that. <laughs> Some good <laughs> stuff. I am not going to talk about it right here. It just we don't have time, but just Black Liberation Theology. Write that down, memorize it, Google it, go to the library, look, see if you can find some reference in the library about it. Because if it's a white library in a white place, they may not have anything about Black Liberation Theology, but it's good stuff. It's really, really good stuff. And, you know, the slave owners used to use the Bible as a weapon, and which is still oftentimes used um, against those of us who are of color, um, used, you would use Bible phrases as weapons against us to uh, convince us and to, um, to remain docile in enslavement and that this was our lot in life and that we should be, just be happy and sing songs while we're out there doing backbreaking work and tilling the soil that of course have been stolen from indigenous, right? 
and <laughs> and planting the cotton or the tobacco or all these different things that we were all forced to do and build and build and then send the product of our backbreaking labor to the north to be milled you know the northerners would say oh we're against slavery but they made a lot of money off of um, processing what slaves produced for slave owners enslaved people i should say produced for slave owners in the south um, there's just so much to it i could recommend a couple of books for people to read how to be an anti-racist um, um, me and white supremacy is another one i think by leila f Saad, which is a really good one and it comes with a journal um, white fragility is another one but there's there are some really really good books and some really great native books like the indigenous people's history of the united states is eye-opening for so many people by roxanne dunbar ortiz and i think i've, I've got that right behind me yes right here on my desk behind me if you want to hold it up, uh, Roxanne has a, she has a house down in Browning. Does she? Come, yes, she does. Well, and um, she's uh, worked on a lot of really good, there you go, Indigenous People History. It's excellent. Um, and it's, I believe it's a healing book. Oh, yeah. I believe, you know, I just, uh, there's something, uh, there's some kind of beauty when you learn someone's history. And so a lot of like Native Wellness Institute, we just really encourage everyone to hear each other's story. Yeah. Because the, the more you know about a person, the more you have the ability to love that person. Right. And, and I, you know, so I just, just make that comment. Um, so, uh, you know, and I was just thinking to myself, you know, this healing on a spiritual level, you know, if everybody here just, lit a smudge or got their got their prayers going that 2021 was a mending time it's almost like a mending time for a different social justice or a, a civil rights a, a civil rights where there is equality where you know that we could feel safe because you know there's some places when you're darker than a paper bag or you look like Pocahontas mm -hmm. or you look um, we're not safe. Yeah, that's so, right. Um, how can we make it a safer world, Judin? What would you? Well, I think a lot of it is watching out for each other. Okay. You know? And um, <clears throat> and also just <sighs> Martin Luther King had a had um, had some things to say about peace. And there's a negative piece and there's a positive piece. A negative piece is one where there's, where all you're doing is you're just shoveling the dust and crumbs and all that kind of stuff underneath the carpet, underneath the rug. So they can't be dealt with. You always know that that yuck is there. That stuff that could rot and mold your carpet, your rug and, and stain your floor. But if you just shove it underneath the carpet you can't see it so you can make like it's not there mm. or you can clean it up you can clean it up do your sweeping do your get down on your knees and wash it and treat the floor treat the rug whatever you need to do and get all that stuff out um peace is a just peace and it's a positive peace because you're doing that work as opposed to a negative piece, which is a completely false piece. Mm -hmm. so we have to just do the work. We have to be together in, in, in support and solidarity, those of us who are BIPOC, Black Indigenous, Black Indigenous and people of color. And we have to, and what our mission is for the Montana Racial Equity Project is to educate and activate um, anti-racists. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm which is something, as I've said before, we've, we've each talked about it, um, is something that must be done on a daily basis and always be in our mind and our thought. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of people out there who go, eh, it's not worth it. I really don't care about them anyway. Don't worry about them. Leave them alone. Talk to the ones who do want to 
make changes, yeah. want to be a better person. Because right. if we can, the more racism, bigotry, and prejudice that we can eliminate, the better the world is for everyone in it. Yes. It, and thank you so much. You know, as you were talking, um, you know, a lot of tribes, we have uh, forgiveness ceremonies. Mm. And um, his Tom Tailfeathers, and, and Tom is, uh, he's still alive, but he talked about this. Oh, I heard him talk about it over 25 years ago. He said that um, if, if our people, and it also heals uh, lateral oppression. He mm. said if they were bumping heads or they didn't agree, they had a ceremony and it was called the peppermint forgiveness ceremony peppermint huh? and you know and peppermint grows all over montana you can go and pick it, it i mean it has all medicinal it, it it can heal it can even help you if you have COVID. you mm -hmm. know peppermint but he said you you bring um a hot pot of peppermint you know because often they would just boil it and steam it and you go to that person's house and you knock and you and and they invite you in and you say to them yeah um, i you know i made you some peppermint tea for us can can we start new and and so then you know it's the process you go into you sit at their table in their house and and when you pour the hot peppermint tea, and man, that stuff smells good. Right now, I, yeah. I'm gonna get off and make me some. <laughs> I'm gonna do the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> so then, then in the ceremony, because they knew if you came like that, that you had to start new because you can't, in the community, you had to help each other. You know, when it's 70 below, you have to help each other. You can't be fighting each other. So. And he said in the ceremony is if when you took that peppermint that this person with their intention had given you and you sip that peppermint, all is forgiven. Mm. So um, maybe, you know, I don't know, maybe Judith, maybe we all got to get together with your staff and we'll get the tribal councils and we'll get some peppermint and we'll we'll march to Washington, D.C. <laughs> You know, Heal. I just, it's, Heal. you know, <laughs> because, um, there's we do some round dancing too. <laughs> yes, we'll have some round dancing. We'll have grand entry. We'll have <laughs> all of, and then we'll listen to each other's story because, you know, I notice, you know, I'll, I have to, well, I'll say two ears, one mouth is I'm really trying to listen to white people. Mm -hmm. And I'm good at it on some days. And like what you said earlier, that it's a 24, you work on it this 24 hours and then take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm really, you know, to try to see how my hand can go halfway across the table. And in some days I'm not good at it. I admit it. You know, there's just been yeah. too much, pain. but I've just been thinking when I do go out, cause you know, on our reservation we're I think we're at 25% inoculated but when we're able to gather again, I was just in our transformation. How can we go out as an anti-racist? <laughs> you know, how yeah. can we all gather and go out in a in a better way? Um, so in our, a couple a couple minutes we got left. So what kind of words would you just like to say out there, Judith? Because we love listening to you. Oh shoot. <laughs> I could listen to you forever. I could sit at a table with you and Betty and Lori for hours. I'm like, oh, okay, just give me a catheter. I don't want to get up. I don't want to have to take time out to go to the bathroom, you know? So <laughs> I only have these great conversations, wide ranging. I just love that stuff. And I so missed coming up for the North American Indian Days this last summer. We, our whole staff was going to come up. It was going to be so good. We were going to be there for four days. Anyway, um, what else? I just want to say, take take care of ourselves. Take care of yourself. Um, all of us who are BIPOC, we need, you know we live with stress every day, even whether we acknowledge it or not. 
back in the back in the day, back during enslavement and you know all this the westward ho and all that kind of stuff we were lucky if we lived to 50. you me you know all our families we were lucky if we lived to 50 and we were probably broken by then too or you know from backbreaking work um be kind to ourselves stay firm stay determined black lives matter um and uh, and water is life. Mm. Mm. We love that. We appreciate and we want to thank you, um, Native Wellness Institute. We, um, I think the Noise Foundation is um, sponsoring us. We're free every day, 267 uh, power hours and we're going to continue NWI is going to continue as long as we can so we're going to keep inviting Judith and many groups like Judith to the table because we really believe in that solidarity so Judith we love you and we'll we'll see you again on the next power hour <laughs> not, well not the nets I'm a little tired I need this three-day weekend I'm getting you know <laughs> enjoy All right, we're on three-day weekend and Monday is call it all chiefs day so <laughs> oh. all day we declared it all chiefs day it's been for about 20 years <laughs> so, I love um, that. so happy all chiefs day to everyone and thank you for joining us on uh, nwi's power hour we're just really joyful that we could start this conversation and please continue this conversation with good intentions thank you judith we're gonna sign off I love you. Cyber I hug. love you. <laughs> Bye, Theta. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs>